thrilled and excited to finally have Sherelle Barber here with us. We tried last semester, um, but it was a hurricane, um, so we had to cancel. I was nervous when they started calling for snow and ice in the weather report. I was like, I'm going to cancel again. <laughs> but um, we have here Dr. Barber, who is a faculty member at the Drexel Lawrence High School of Public Health. Um, she received her Doctor of Science in Social Epidemiology from Harvard Chan School of Public Health and her Master of Public Health and Health Behavior and Health Education from UNC Chapel Hill. Her research focuses on the intersection of place, race, and health and examines the role of structural racism in shaping health and racial ethnic health inequalities among blacks with a particular focus on the southern United States and Brazil. And today she'll be presenting in mind racism, residential segregation, and crime of others in the United States and Brazil. So welcome. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna do what my dad does a little bit. He's a pastor and asks folks that are in the back if they can move over. <laughs> <laughs> We're at home, I'm at home, and um, I just wanna just thank you, Chantel, for the invitation and for coordinating, coordinating everything. Where's Allison? Okay, thank you, Allison, again, also for the invitation to come and to be here. Um, like I said, I'm at home, um, and so I finished my master's here. Actually, not in Ebony, but in the Department of Health Behavioral Health Education, HEBE, was what it was at that time, uh, back in 2009, and went on to uh, do my doctoral work at, at Harvard. Um, but it's and, but North Carolina is home. Uh, this is home for me, and so it's really, really good to be in this space with you all um, this afternoon. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna, um, talk about uh, some of my work. Um, I've been doing variations of this uh, lecture across uh, different settings, so some of you all who've seen me in other places may see things that are familiar, but I, I wanna just kind of give you a guide of how it will go. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about kind of the current and historical kind of uh, place, those re researching kind of con uh, current and contemporary um, um, issues around structural racism. Um, and then provide some of the theoretical foundations that I use in my work, and then do some work, on, uh, show you all some of the empirical research that I do, um, both here in the United States with the Jackson Heart Study and in Brazil with the Brazilian Longitudinal Study of Adult Health. So, I'm gonna get a little morbid and say, um, this quote is from Maria de Franco, who is an Afro-Brazilian politician and human rights activist. Um, these are words she said on March 14, 2018, uh, to a group of women, uh, one of which was myself, um, as she was talking about kind of the plight of what's happening in black and poor communities in Brazil, particularly in Rio, and she said, we are dying. Our people are dying. Um, and as a social epidemiologist and as an epidemiologist in general, I think that one of the, one of the things we do is we look at death, right? are always looking at mortality statistics, morbidity statistics. And so our work is to understand who dies and why, what populations die more often and why, and what are the structural drivers and the ways in which the systems in our world uh, make it so that some groups of people, like blacks and other uh, racialized minority groups, um, experience death at much higher rates um, and much younger ages and also um, in both very vicious and violent and also very insidious ways, right? And so variations of this talk, like I said, I've given, and unfortunately, I always find a contemporary or very recent example of how this shows up. And so, a Tatiana Jefferson, shot by the, a police officer while she was in her home. Um, and this work is, is it's very sobering, um, because this kind of vicious, violent death that's in our face, um, we know is rooted in the system and the structures of racism that exists in our society. And so we, we saw this, we witnessed this, um, and we witnessed it over and over again. And then just a couple of days ago, we got the news that her father also passed away just weeks after she was killed, right? And so what is it about this system the way we structure our society, that black folks and other racialized minority groups die in these ways, right? Why is it that we, um, that, that some lives matter more than others and that we find this um, in example after example and statistic after statistic 
that black lives, it seems like, sometimes don't really matter. And so uh, Ibram Kennedy, who is actually going to be in Goldsboro, North Carolina, many of you all are around, he's going to be at my dad's church in Goldsboro, that's the plug for Ibram, um, actually wrote this really interesting op-ed, which he's not a social epidemiologist, but I was like, this is a social ethnic kind of <laughs> statement. The greatest white privilege is life itself, right? And so when we think about the statistics that we see in terms of death, in terms of mortality, and the heightened, uh, or the higher rates of mortality across a wide range of health issues, um, we have to think about this, again, this issue of structural racism, this if issue of privilege, right, that would, would, would create the statistics that we see, um, such as this. And so we know that with life expectancy, if you look at it by, for blacks and whites, black males have the lowest life expectancy. Um, in, in the United States, followed by white men, then black women, and then, uh, of course, white females. But again, we have to, as epidemiologists, the questions and what we have to think about is, is why is this the case? Why are we seeing uh, the kinds of inequalities in uh, these outcomes? And so I think this year, um, in particular, has been a great year to really delve into this. It's always timely to talk about racism, and it's always timely to talk about the history of slavery and that legacy and how it's led us to this present day. But I think if you have not seen the 1619 Project in the New York Times or read any other podcasts, I think it's a very timely um, project that really has um, allowed in the public discourse for us to have these conversations, right? So we, you know, those of us who study this work and do this work, we've known this for years. Slavery matters because it set off this cascade of events that have led to the marginalized racial status of blacks in this country. But this attention to how slavery still finds its way in the fabric of our justice system and the ways in which we set up our hospitals and the ways in which um, we live our lives is really important as we navigate trying to understand racial health inequalities. And so the 1619 Project is really a really nice expose um, that documents the ways in which slavery kind of impacts our, uh, both historically and contemporary. But what I like about this project is it also highlights the resistance, the active resistance of black communities over time, and that we've not just been standing by while these things happen to us, that there's been active resistance to make a change. And it's in that active resistance that we have seen um, certain gains um, in this country. And so, but again, we can't have a conversation about racial inequalities in health unless we have a conversation about the legacy of slavery and that impact even to this day. And so I like to start off also with a definition of racism. I often um, hearken to uh, Dr. Kamara Jones, who's an epidemiologist. Um, it's a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of what one looks like or what we call race. Um, and it does three things that I think are really important. Um, it unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, so we see the ways in which structural racism exists in certain systems and structures and institutions. But it also unfairly advantages, right? So we can't forget about the unfair advantages, the privileges that come along with racism and the way our society is set up. And I like this last one because I don't think we think about it enough. It actually saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. So the fact that we don't invest in certain communities, the fact that we allow certain communities to, um, uh, uh, to go without and we don't invest in education and in, in housing and all those things, that's actually a disadvantage to all of us. And we're all sinking because of it, right? And so it's really important that we think about kind of racism in this way. Um, and in terms of embodying that, right, so these systems and structures exist, there's racism across institutions, but I really like the way Dorothy Roberts talks about embodiment. Um, she was actually at Drexel just a couple of weeks ago for the Society for African American Public Health Issues Symposium, and she says, race is not a biological category that naturally produces health disparities because of genetic differences. Race is a political category that um, has staggering biological consequences because of the impact of social inequality on people's health, right? And so if we think about, we have to, I think, especially in epidemiology, and especially as we're thinking about it moving forward and pushing the envelope on racial inequalities, we've got to get away from this biological and genetic determinism of race, right? And think about race as something that has been socially constructed and really politically constructed um, in our society. And so this definition really gets us, moves us past that, right? 
to think about the ways in which race in and of itself has been constructed. And it's that, that construction um, that has led to the inequalities that we see in health. Um, another way of thinking about embodiment is also through Dr. Nancy Krieger's work, which is Epidemiology and the People's Health. Um, her work on eco-social theory, uh, which the central question to her research is who and what drives current and changing patterns of social inequalities in health, right? And so we've got, again, thinking, thinking about not just the individuals, that, the individual kind of determinants of health, but what are the structures, who and what, what are the structures that actually drive these inequalities? And so kind of bringing it to this issue of residential segregation, I think residential segregation represents one of the most powerful drivers, structural drivers of population health and health inequalities. Um, and that is because there are so many aspects of residentially segregated neighborhoods that influence our health, um, whether it be the physical and social environment, whether it be the lack or the suppression of political power in these spaces, the ways in which we have spatially segregated uh, the neighborhoods in the, in the United States, and, and as I'll show you in other parts of the world, really um, creates this milieu of adverse conditions that becomes embodied, right? And so it's and, and so segregation where we live is one of the ways that we incorporate biologically the natural and social world in which we live, right? And so again, kind of bringing these two together, kind of thinking about embodiment from a social perspective and residential segregation is just really a fundamental driver of health inequalities. And so I often talk about in, in, this, in this work is that in order to understand residential segregation, so some people think, oh, it's just, that's just the way things are. You know, black folks are on one side of the city, white folks are on the other. But that's not how it happened. It was actually constructed, right? And so if we can construct segregation in our cities, then we can deconstruct it in our cities. And so The Color of Law is a really fascinating book that goes detail by detail of how the, at the federal, the state and the local level, there were policies put into place to segregate the neighborhoods in our, in our, in our cities, right? And so when you think about racism, and we remove this from kind of this interpersonal interactions and think about, no, it's these institutions that have created through policy, right? That's what we're talking about when we talk about structural racism. And so this is a redlining map. I'm sure some of you all have seen this. Um, this is actually a Philadelphia, which is where I live right now. Um, but the, 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 what happened in the 1930s with redlining really set the stage for American cities across the United States. And so basically what it was is you had the Home Owners Loan Corporation, which created these maps of cities across the United States. And there were these color-coded maps where um, these maps were basically dictating where investment would happen by banks, right? And so you had maps, uh, areas of the maps that were color-coded green, which was basically like you know green light to invest in these areas. Um, some were color-coded blue, which was you know pretty good for investment, and banks were encouraged to give loans there. When you begin to get to the the color code of yellow, um, these were places where they said that there was uh, um, the chance for infiltration, and what they meant they were closer to black or or other poor communities and other poor parts of the city. Um, and then there were parts of the maps that were redlined, meaning basically banks should not invest in these areas for home or home loans, right? And so here in the 1930s, you literally create all across the country, these maps where you say, we're gonna invest in these neighborhoods, right? And we're not gonna invest in other neighborhoods. And that sets the stage for what we see in terms of contemporary forms of residential segregation. So we have these redlining maps, but we also had things called restricted residential covenants, where literally whole communities would get together and say, you know, we're not going to, um, in this community, we will not rent or sell to black folks in this community, right? And so that was, again, a way of keeping individuals out of certain communities across the United States. And then finally, um, if the red lining wasn't enough, if the restricted covenants weren't enough, then we actually, in this country, re resorted to racial violence, right? And so this is actually newspaper clippings from